Hey, everybody. Welcome to the first November KCP Office Hours meeting. Uh, it's November 1st. And if you um, have anything that you would like to, to discuss today, please add it to the uh, GitHub issue that I just pasted the link in chat for our community meeting. And I'm going to go ahead and yield over to Andy to talk about Edge, if you're ready. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us. Welcome back from KubeCon. Uh, we've been having some discussions in the background about what it would take to support the Edge use. And we feel at this point we know enough about what uh, KCP represents in terms of ecosystem and the partnerships and the community representation. And uh, of course, the components and the elements that everybody's worked very hard on. So we think that this provides us a good, a good basis for us to, um, to work in a vein that would bring about certain componentry or PRs or additions to technology that would extend KCP to cover the edge multi-cluster works uh, management workspace. And so uh, Andy and Stefan, we had an initial discussion with them and they were agreeable that we might introduce or uh, ask to introduce a special interest group uh, within KCP called KCP Edge. Uh, Palladatory, Mike Sprites or Ezra Silvera and myself would like to chair that, that SIG and ask for participation from others within KCP and externally, um, folks from the CNCF that have some vested interest in this space would all would be uh, more than welcome. So this is where we wanted to start off today. And we thought we'd like to make an announcement today that we're open for business. Uh, we'd like some participation from any of you that have some interest in this space. And we have some logistics that we've got to hammer out. But for the most part, uh, we've had some internal and external discussions during COVID and they seem to be fairly positive and this is also you know acting on on the the very successful t talk and discussion that stefan shared at kubecon so it was really i think uh really complimentary to have this timing awesome so, um does anybody have any questions or are there any more introductory details that um, or maybe worth sharing around some of the differences or challenges that you face at the edge as opposed to some of the things that uh, we've been experimenting with for so that's right there is a document that, that we shared um, with the KCP dev mailing list um, uh, I guess Andy shared it last week yeah it's issue 2241 Andy if you want to share that sure <laughs> And we so are working on another document with kind of a, I think, a bigger, um, a wider lens, um, also to share. Yep. So we've got right now is at the moment we're working on an, uh, an investigation page for KCP.io. So we've got an internal discussion taking place over that. In this uh, specific epic, we listed. What are some of our purposes, the purposes that we have behind creating awareness and, of course, bringing people in to work driving concerns. The driving concerns document is in large measure is a Google Doc, but didn't have a way to share it with a community just yet. So we didn't do that. We shared it within here. So this is the eight driving concerns that are listed below. Actually, those uh, are copied from the. Wait, wait a minute. Yeah. Those those are copied from the Google Doc, which has been shared That's with the, the KCP Dev mailing list. Right. Some people didn't have access to it. Those that were trying to uh, okay. sign on to the project. Yeah. Where? Right. And is this it, is actually is a. This? Yes. Right. And this is one yep. of the logistic things. Right. I did this using my Red Hat account, and I don't think their Red Hat accounts have a way to share something with the world. So right? yeah, so, you, you have to be in the KCP Dev. Google group. Right. So, you know, I'm happy to share this with the world. Uh, I just don't know how. And, you know, maybe we're part of what we're going to do is, you know, or, as we get organized, you know, we need to have a different way of sharing things. Yeah, the, the Red Hat accounts can't share with public. You can only share with specific people or groups. But our 
MO to date has just been to share with the KCP dev um, Google group. And as long as you're a member and it's, it's free and open to join, then you can see it. Right. So that's what we've done here so far. Cool. All right. So um, we just have some going? logistical items uh, that we wanted to go through with you and the community, yeah. if it's suitable. So we, our tentative, uh, we have a, a placeholder for a meeting link this Thursday, 10 a.m. Do it in a biweekly fashion, uh, so not to be cumbersome on the other folks and taxing on their time. We'd like to be able, if that's not agreeable, we'd be happy to move it uh, to see what can accommodate either other time zones or regions accordingly. We have, uh, we don't yet have a decision, or we'd like to have to open up a discussion about where we could have a place to carve out a GitHub location, um, potentially a place to have Slack if it's using the regular KCP Dev Slack. That's that's fine. Uh, it's it's entirely up to you. And then of course, you know, a mailing distribution list. If we want to continue to use KCP Dev, that's fine. Or should we dedicate a group to it of its own? These are all you know decisions or uh, things we'd like to bounce off of you. If, if you have any ideas or suggestions, we're open to them. Yeah. Um, one thought that was not something you just brought up was we do have um, the ability to invite the Google group to the meeting. So if one of you all wanted to, you could create a calendar invitation, invite KCP Dev uh, for this 10 a.m. And then um, everybody who's a member of the Google group would get the invitation. OK, I have it on the Red Hat. Uh, calendar, so I'll just add KCP Dev as a member now. Got it. Okay, you're all invited. Okay, and um, did you all want to talk about this stuff right now, or wait until the Thursday meeting to have that conversation? If you feel that, you, uh, yeah, if you're able to attend, that would be probably more appropriate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me... Yeah, we we did a bit of an introduction earlier. I think probably. Um... I'm guessing sort of the next step is to be able to, to take more time than you want in this meeting. Um, so that's why the Thursday meeting. Okay, let's let's plan on doing it then. Um, I think my calendar is free. So uh, that'd be cool. I'll see you all there. Great. So in that meeting, we plan on doing an introduction and getting some of the logistics out of the way. And of course, detailing what the difference is between the multi-edge use case, uh, multi, yeah, the edge multi-cluster use case and today provides support for and then we'll go into some of the sub items that are below that which are things like you know uh, piggybacking off the TMC technology to date maybe making it out our own called EMC uh, some discussion perhaps about sharding and the like so we've got all kinds of discussions queued up but we want to take it uh, nice and easy and slow to make sure that we bring the community along with us so we look forward to seeing you all on Thursday thank you very much for your time during this meeting OK, thanks so much. Um, any any other questions from anybody on the edge bit before we move on to the next topic? Not seeing anybody unmute. So Steve K, you are up next. Uh, cool. Um, we have. Uh, geez, um, I guess <clears throat> so. We're uh, currently doing a refactor of all of the uh, clients, listers, informers, everything to do with contacting a KCP server and providing the uh, logical cluster, the workspace that you're working with. Um, we have rolled out the uh, clients for built in Kubernetes types and API extensions. Um, I'm almost finished with the ones that we have for uh, the types that KCP itself produces. Um, so you'll see a little bit of change in the code. Uh, it'll be enforced by the type system now that like you actually provide a logical cluster when you need to. Um, there's no more ambiguity about who you're contacting for information. Um, if anyone's working on or anyone has a controller that runs against the Kubernetes cluster today, and they're hoping to prove out running against a KCP cluster as well, 
get in contact. Um, the generators and all the machinery and stuff around these client interactions, the goal is that you should have one code base and whether or not you're talking to KCP and operating against like, many different workspaces or if you're talking against you know one cube cluster, it should work either way. Um, and so I'd love to partner with anyone that is has a problem like that uh, to, to make sure that that's actually true. Um, but yeah, one one more refactor in, in the works for the KCP repo. Otherwise, feedback on the ergonomics of using this stuff would be super helpful. Um, it shouldn't have any functional impact when we change things, though. Uh, uh, Steve, a quick question, uh, mm -hmm. can I? Uh, so if I'm uh, linking to, to the client Go here in KCP and using this cluster aware functionality, but I'm working uh, would it work on a regular Kubernetes cluster without KCP at all? Yeah, the, the hope is yes. So that's, that's the, the that, hope? Yep, okay. Yep, yep. And the way that we've written it to, uh, if you're importing these cluster-aware client libraries, um, it just uses stock cube client code. So there's no fork, there's no hacks, there's no patches on top. So it should be... Uh, interoperable and not require any GoMod hackery. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you. Go ahead, Paolo. Yes, uh, I have one question. So, so far I saw example using uh, Go client for building this um, workspace aware controller. So I wonder if you have done any work also using uh, controller runtime uh, library uh, from QBuilder. Is something possible to, to use? Uh, there is some plan to do that. Yes, so we have an example uh, controller runtime client, or a controller runtime uh, controller that um, I know Varsha put a bunch of work into that, and then, yep, thanks for pulling this up. Um, so this example is a good one to look at. Um, this is a little bit less finished, uh, and I think we have some follow-up like considerations for this one, but it should work today, and feedback on this one also appreciated. Yeah. yeah, so this one currently requires only one replace statement to use our patched version of controller runtime. We are we have had discussions with the controller runtime community about designing some more abstract interfaces in controller runtime to support the concept of multiple cluster support where if you want to talk to multiple Kubernetes clusters that are real clusters, controller runtime could support you, but it would be sufficiently layered and abstracted so that multiple workspaces could be seen as multiple clusters. So we have not started that work yet. We need to look at the code base, figure out what sort of design changes we would make, but there is appetite in controller runtime to accept those changes, assuming they look good. Yeah, and then a couple you, years ago, I worked with Alvaro to land work anywhere. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Steve. A couple of years ago, I worked with Alvaro to land like actual multi-cluster support for controllers that talk to like many physical clusters. Um, and I, it, it seems like it would be a fairly reasonable next step to abstract mm -hmm. that, where each individual cluster could be or KCP workspace and critically one list watch stream contains events from multiple. Um, but yeah, so that that's still in the future. Um, the reason I was asking about controller runtime was because uh, there are a lot of operators in community already using controller runtime. For example, Crossplane is one. And so I wonder if in, in this model of uh, API export and uh, API as a service, so I, I was wondering how difficult it is for existing uh, operators or controllers using controller runtime somehow to to be able to be plugged into this uh, in this environment to basically be able to to watch uh, resource across multiple workspace without having to rewrite a lot of code. So I wonder that eventually you can get to the point where you can just replace maybe the controller runtime library or the Go client and somehow be able to use existing controllers for for baking APIs that are you know multi multi workspace somehow where. Yeah, of course. Uh, so with this example, uh, we have a couple of folks that have used the example to, to um, instrument controller runtime controllers. So right now, 
you know, the replace directive, I think there's like maybe two or three lines of code they need to change in the actual way that you structure your reconciliation request. And then um, there's a bit of boilerplate code at the beginning. Uh, for instance, if your controller is gonna be going against the an API export, you know, knowing how to contact the particular endpoint that you're contacting, but past that, actually, none of the logic changes. So um, I think we're very close to what you're expecting there. OK. If you have a chance to try out the example. Yeah, that, that's good news. Uh, yeah, I certainly try out this example. Yeah, thank you so much. OK, um, any other questions on that one? Not seeing anybody. So um, let's move on to the next topic here, Frederic, around um, discovery and selection of KCP shards. Yeah, OK. So a, a bit of background on that. Uh, Lukas has uh, been doing some work and developing a, a cache server where we uh, store things like uh, API export and uh, API resource schemas. The idea is that uh, these resources are globally uh, available. So in a sharded world, uh, you have shards that are separate, like separate clusters. And um, this uh, cache server makes uh, these uh, specific resources, API export and uh, uh, resource schemas uh, globally uh, uh, available. Uh, when you want to write uh, a controller, uh, which is uh, multi-cluster, multi-shards aware, it will need to discover the URL for communicating with, with the different shards. Every shard we will have a, a, a different URL. And this information today is stored in uh, the API export, in the status of the API export. And the, the challenge we have is uh, the selection process. So you probably will have multiple instances of your controller, uh, at least one per region, that will um, communicate and um, do the reconciliation for uh, resources in the same region, so possibly in a, a multiple shards. Uh, for doing the reconciliation of multiple shards, it, it means that you will uh, start uh, a, a controller per shard because, uh, again, shards are uh, different uh, cluster, so you need a separate informer for each shard. And uh, so this uh, mechanism is, um, is pretty clear. But uh, there is one point uh, around uh, the selection process. Uh, we, we, we need some uh, information that we don't have today uh, for knowing that uh, this controller deployed, let's say, in Europe, uh, will uh, only uh, process shards that are located in, in the same region, so in Germany, France, and Italy, but not the uh, United States, for instance. Right, so we have uh, discussed uh, last week uh, three approaches for uh, getting this information. So the first approach uh, was to add labels to the API export because the API export can already be retrieved globally. And next to the URL for each shard, we could add a label and this label would originates from uh, the resource name uh, cluster workspace shard. When you register a new shard in KCP, you create a resource in the roots workspace, which is uh, called a cluster workspace shard. And we could add labels there that says, for instance, uh, this shard in is based in US is one, or uh, this shard is for production or, or whatever may, may be uh, relevant. And the idea with this approach is that um, the controller can uh, retrieve the information from the API export and uh, 
decide, okay, I, I want to, um, so the manager will decide to, to start a, a new controller, new informer for uh, this uh, uh, shard in uh, the same region, but not for the shard with the uh, labels for a different region. So there are issues with, with this approach, and uh, Steve um, uh, raised that. Uh, we are uh, creating uh, some um, uh, some more uh, rights, uh, uh, copying the, the, the label, uh, shared resource to all the different uh, uh, API exports, and uh, that may be a, a lot of labor. So, Stefan, yeah? Uh, why is this a problem? Like, we can prefix them, like the three labels we need, we have to copy. And it's a system controller, so, so it doesn't matter. Permission wise, at least. Uh, yeah, and uh, okay, so there, there, there are two things. So if we do a bit of math, so if we say that we have a um, thousand charts, so that was uh, the limit that it was. Uh, uh, Mention uh, uh, as a goal for KCP to be able to support thousand shards. Uh, if we say that API export, which may be well possible, and we have a three a label per shard, that's uh, already a, a a lot of uh, labels that will be uh, copied uh, everywhere because in each API export we will have uh, two hundred. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, we, we will have uh, three thousand labels, three labels per uh, thousand shards. It's still in and the size of an object, right? Hmm? But it's it's a little ugly. Um, maybe. So you know services, services and endpoints, maybe it's a similar example, right? So maybe yeah. you should think about that in the second step at least. Also, there is one question. Um, your controllers will run in different regions. So we have to think about how to distribute this information because API export object is in this one workspace, right? Let's run through the other options here, I think, before yes. we... Okay, so for, for the API export, yeah, yeah, as the idea is that it is accessible globally through the, the cache server. Uh, okay, but let, let, let's move to uh, the next uh, option. So uh, the option two was to, to make the, the cluster workspace shard resource uh, globally uh, available. So again, to have it on the cache server in by doing that, we, we don't need to replicate uh, the, the label from the shard on the API export. So there, there are also challenges with that. So one, for instance, we, we have um, three different URLs uh, that are uh, recorded in the cluster workspace shard, one of them being for internal communication. So that may be related to internal B and platform administrator may not want to have that visible globally by third parties. Uh, another challenge is we are adding a, a, a new resource to the cache server, so that means also more uh, copies and more um, uh, replication. So the, the third approach is, is different, and the idea is to do the, the filtering on the server side. So based on uh, um, uh, the location of uh, or uh, at least uh, uh, the shard on which the, uh, the controller is related to. So because that's been deployed uh, in the KCP workspace or because uh, the cube config it is using for communicating and doing the discovery is bound to a specific shard. Uh, it, it is possible for uh, the, uh, the API server or the cache server to do the filtering and uh, only 
um, sent an API export field which has only the errors that are relevant. So if we set in the API export, uh, she uh, named a region, for instance, and if the uh, the uh, shard where the controller has been deployed is in the region uh, Europe, so that's labeled on the cluster workspace shard. It will only get when it does a get API export. Um, it, it will only get the URL for the shard in, in the same region and not for uh, shard in, um, in in United States. So the advantage of this approach is that there is, there is no uh, need for uh, any um, copy of a label. Uh, there are a, a few uh, question marks. So uh, one of them is that it, it, it has a bit of processing. So this uh, calculation and filtering needs to happen with every request. And the second one is uh, uh, whether it would be uh, possible to to watch uh, this kind of uh, projected resource. So, uh, uh, Steve or Stefan, I don't know who raised the hand first. Uh, okay, so let, let's start with, with Steve. Sure. I think the biggest question for me is like, what do we actually want this API to look like? Um, we talk about nodes and pods in here, but like the pod spec has a lab, uh, node selector the pod does not get to see the full set of labels on each node and then choose from them, right? Like it's it's an implicit API. Uh, you, you can do that. You, and, uh, in a pod, you, you can have a node selector. And, uh, and right, but you don't, the, the difference is not that every person that can create a pod can list all nodes and get all labels and then implement their own filtering and selection, there is a selector, right? Um, and I think the visibility of shards and the topology in general is a question here, right? Like, what, what do we actually want people to care about and look at? And it strikes me that, you know, if we're talking about replicating labels or exposing labels or somehow filtering them, and we're doing that for a very, you know, small set of labels, we are, in essence, creating an explicit API that says, you can see which regions a shard is in, or you can see, you know, whatever, whatever. And it might be advantageous for us to have like an actual API for that rather than dumping a bunch of data onto the client and then letting them do whatever um, on that. I think there's also a question here of like, yeah, like do we want users to have their own opinions on how they run vis-a-vis some global topology, or do we want to provide a clearly delineated, please give me the data from my own region sort of API? Yeah, Steve, I yeah, want to I, say, say the same thing. Can I pile so, on a little bit too, in, in kind of in a broader sense? I, I mean, I see a lot of tendency to put in kube objects, you know, what should be spec into labels and annotations, right? I mean, in general, uh, you know, it, it should be spec, although since we can't do label selectors on custom resources, you know, I understand why things go to labels, but, you know, I keep thinking, you know, addressing that problem uh, is what you we should be doing. I would, I, would, I would counter field selectors, that, yeah. That I think, Mike, this is exactly the use of labels, exactly what the cube inventors has defined, what, how labels should be used. And I, I think, uh, Steve, your, your, your idea, I think it's good. Like, build an object which gives you a subset of virtual workspace URLs. And it ha in the spec, it has a selector, as simple as that. That's basically the simple, simplest thing we could do. Um, it gives everything we need. You just get the information you need. And again, to my, my remark before, we have to expose this thing maybe in different workspaces. So maybe you will have a workspace for each region where your controller will run and will put this object in there, which gives you the virtual workspace URLs, and will point to the export. The export comes implicitly from the cache. But basically, your object is local. It's available all the time. So I think this is a much better API. And 
I'm not sure about all those hacks around discovery and caching and filtering. Let's make it explicit. Try to understand. I mean, we understood now what we need. So I think we are pretty further along the line already to understand how an API would look like. Steve, did you have this in mind? Like a node uh, selector like thing, a chart selector basically? Yeah, either that or like a, a service that, like, please filter this API export for me. That's Even what I mean. More, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's one question maybe we can talk about. Um, this is kind of implicit. Like, if we have, uh, so you have to document basically which labels exist. And the user has to then select. I mean, the simplest case, there is no selector, like it's empty, matches everything. But you can read up the documentation of KCP and see there are those three levels of topology, and you have to use the labels to get the one you want. My gut feeling is it's enough. We don't have to expose the complete hierarchy in a different way. Yeah, I think um, we, we might get a lot of value from even filter this down to the virtual workspace URL that is on my shard, filter this down to the virtual workspace URL that is on my region, Yeah, filter so this down order, to right? all global ones, right? Is this, is it, does it mean we need an order of labels like which describe topology, maybe? Well, I, I guess I'm almost thinking like labels might be a technically sufficient implementation, but at the same time, I, I don't know. An even more explicit API that says region <laughs> colon true <laughs> might be even simpler. Because okay. then you don't need yeah. to, like, what, what would the client flow look like? If I'm deploying a uh, an instance of my controller per region, right? I would need to somehow discover what region I'm in and then pass that into my label selector. Like, I, why should I even care? Yeah, good point. So basically, we would say we have maybe cloud, region, and zone, or something like that. And you can select which level you want for partitioning. And it, it, you know, we might might as well, like, if it's reasonable to implement this using labels in the back, like that, that's fine. But the user facing thing might be even simpler. Yeah, I like that. Okay, so do you all have a, a path forward at this point? Uh, I think so. Just um, le le let me summarize to make sure that I understand properly. So the, the path forward would be uh, to, to look at uh, uh, opinionated, opinionated um, uh, uh, selection uh, uh, value. Uh, so like a cloud region and shard. That's something that will be uh, defined and uh, uh, and, and presets uh, that can be uh, extended or uh, changed by, by by users. And based on that, we would. Uh, yeah, one, one thing uh, I'm not 100% sure. So you 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 want a separate resource because it, it would also be also possible to to have that directly in the API export, but you 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 want. That to be defined in different resource. Yeah, for, for reasons of size, obviously, but also because it must maybe live in a different workspace. Okay. Oh, one question you, we had when we were talking through this last week. Um, so I'm I'm some user client deployment. I found using my local client and my cache client, I found that API export for which I'm actually running. Now I need to know who do I ask <laughs> to figure out which of the URLs on that export are within my region? How do I find that endpoint? So this goes away, right, if it's implicit. So we're saying that actually the API that you use to get the export in the first place will do the filtering for you. 
I'm confused. I don't know if I you all talk about, I don't know if you all talk about this, but um, the the list of URLs is a struct, and they happen to have it happens to have one field, which is the the URL itself. If we put labels on there, and we copied the labels from the shard, and like, could we do something like that? Yeah, that so, was so the size option one. The size problem, yeah. But also, again, we have to make it available in a different workspace. That's yeah. not enough. There's no right. access to a cache. You don't have access to that. So my my recommendation would be coming back, Stefan, Steve, whoever, and writing what the understanding is based on this discussion. You know, maybe just add it to the bottom of the doc somewhere. And then we can um, follow up on it async. And if we, we need more discussion, um, we can do it ad hoc or at the next community meeting. Um, Ezra, you've got your hand up. Uh, what's up? Yeah, just quick uh, comment or question. Uh, there are basically two use cases for sharding. One is this, uh, you know, spread across geographic and so on. And we are discussing regions and so on. But the other one, is actually just handle very large scale, right? I'm out of resources, memory, CPU, and so on. I'm going to use millions of workspaces, and I just want the charts. I'm, I'm wondering if in this discussion, ju I just want to make sure we are, no, we are not neglecting this other use case when right. we are saying, oh, we will take the region I'm in. I might be in the same region, right? <laughs> and still, I want to shout. Yeah. So. Very good point. Thank you. We need, we need a different level, basically, right, in the topology, which you can use as an operator and label your partitions. It's not cloud. It's not feature, not zone. It's something else. Yeah, exactly. And this also adds to, I started some discussion. I may also want to be able to let the administrator control the even sharding policy, right? What is the criteria I'm sharding against, not, right? It's not really maybe according to region and so on. I may have my arbitrary kind of policy by which I want to shard stuff. And um, when you say the operator, this is the, the, can be two, right? It can be the cluster, the KCP operator, but it can also be the controller operator. But, uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with all the roles, but someone should be able to do that. Okay, yeah. maybe the co operator, right? Yeah, maybe we, by type of resource or whatever. So it should be noted that like the content of a workspace, like every type, every object within that workspace has to be co-located on a shard today. So, um, and I, I don't think we see that changing in the future. Like some of the guarantees that we want to provide about workspaces break down when half of your workspace is in a different network region across the world. Um, so I think we'd need to think through, like, what does it mean for, like, if, if I'm building a controller and I know that the scale of data is really large, and I know that even within a region, I'm going to have multiple processes because, you know, for horizontal, I'm not under control of where the data lives, though. Like, the KCP system Steve. is moving shards around, right? Uh, and, Steve, and, I think what, what Ezra is saying is he's talking about a multiplicity of workspaces, uh, but they're all in the same region. You're using multiple because you can't have one server host them all. Yes, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm in exactly. accordance with that. I'm just saying like the number of workspaces and the uh, like the consistent hashing between the workspace and the shard that it ends up on is not under the control of the controller author. And so we need to think through like what kind of API we would want for that. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to point out this use case. And the last comment is, because I'm looking at large scale, and this is the use case I want to attack, I want to make sure also that the cache server is not becoming a bottleneck in terms of you know performance, memory, and all of that, right? Because the, if we will move everything to the cache server, then you know I need to solve that issue as well. Yep. So, so um, I, I'm going to call time on this for today. I yeah. think this has been a fantastic discussion, but um, we are <laughs> out of time for this topic for this meeting. I would encourage um, Frederick and anybody else that's interested, please schedule a separate design meeting 
with the folks who have been talking about this in the meeting today and anybody else who's interested and uh, continue the discussion there if that works for you. So, um, Frederic, do you want to take on trying to schedule that? Uh, yeah, I would do that. OK, awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, we have about 20 minutes left. Nolan, you've got a narrowly scoped permissions claims, permission claims doc that you wanted to bring to our attention. Yeah, so this design document is about giving access to a limited subset of objects within a group resource. Uh, the example I'm using is secrets. Um, you may want to get access to a specific secret that's relevant to your work, but not see any others. So we are investigating um, three cases uh, for doing this. Um, first is identifying a specific object by name and namespace. So this is when there's a well-known name or, um, yeah, that, that, that one's pretty straightforward. Uh, the other is grabbing a collection of objects based on some label selector. So uh, let's say you have multiple deployments or multiple secrets or load balancer uh, information. Um, this would be a way to get access to only those objects labeled that way. Uh, and then the final option, which is perhaps the trickiest, is um, what I'm referring to as owned objects. So this would be things like uh, things that you don't necessarily create with your controller, but they are um, second order objects. So volumes mounted into a pod, um, config maps mounted into a pod, or, or something of that nature. Um, we've also got some folks in, in this issue, 1937, uh, folks have enumerated specific use cases, um, more, more detailed than the general stuff I'm giving here. Um, so in terms of the interface that we're proposing, um, actually, um, Sergius has expanded the permission claim to have a resource selectors field uh, that is now in. Um, he's using this for reverse permission claims as well. And I'm currently working on plumbing that into uh, admission and reconciliation for just named objects. I have not tackled label selectors yet. Um, so I mostly wanted to use this as a heads up and give people awareness um, and possibly field any questions that people might have or use cases. Thank you, Nolan. Um, anybody have anything top of mind or need some time to think about it and maybe respond async? Um, one small comment there on the terminology, simply. Mm -hmm. um, own, I mean, Kubernetes does have a concept of own that yeah. I think is not exactly what was meant. Right. Um, right. So you might want to use just a different word okay. or expand on it. Uh, so, you know, I would say maybe linked or related um, rather than owned. Okay. That's good feedback. Um, and I'll also say, I think this will be implemented in phases and this will, the, the linked objects will likely be the last one. Um, yeah, uh, Varsha. Yeah, um, I just wanted to point out that these changes are pretty relevant to the uh, PR which we merged, which has the CLI commands on getting permission claims and listing. We could probably add more flags for uh, whatever uh, increase. Uh, specs which have been added to permission claims but uh, yeah we'll, we i can have a discussion with nolan later um, okay we can work on it okay thanks i didn't i didn't think of that um, uh, Stefan? Yeah. yeah two questions or remarks uh, maybe inspire us people to think about it so barfa's comment about those things should be 
you should be able to render them. The user should explain them. I think this is one of the properties we need. So if we have complicated JSON paths or CL, this it's not so easy to render um, to understand. And the second thing is, is a question for everybody who's interested in this area to think about. Um, this is, I mean, so the owned object thing has security implications, right? You own the object, so maybe you can change it. So um, you can suddenly read all the secrets because you can change the main object. So we, we talked about maybe the spec of an object is owned by a user and not by the service provider, those kind of things. And if it's about JSON pass or CL or something like that, we want conversion. Conversion also gives some kind of control to a service provider. So I leave it here. Think about it. Um, interesting topic. If you have ideas you want to contribute, that's really green field. Lots of interesting questions. Yeah, I guess I'll just add to that just briefly. Um, you used owned now, and I'm not confused. I'm not sure whether you meant the previous sense of owned or different sense of owned. Um, so owned in, in the doc, like uh, reference, somehow, linked. like a volume plug, linked, whatever, yeah. OK. But you, you started to talk about a different sort of ownership, um, which is you know, about a user um, rather than a different object, uh, which is, I was, I was kind of expecting that. I was uh, interested to see that it wasn't here. Right. One of the things that other people have identified is they really wish as a general feature of the Kube API, you could say, you know, list secrets, you know, not all of them, just the ones that I'm authorized to read. Yeah, it's, it's not really owned what I have in mind in this sense. It's not the user, it's more like the actor, like the actor which is in the workspace, which uh, which binds, so the binder mm -hmm. actor, something right. like that. And then there's another sense, right, which it came from the introduction of server-side apply, uh, which is, assigns uh, field managers to parts of objects. Yes, that's what I had in mind. Anyway, so let's leave it here. Um, please get engaged, look the doc, come up with ideas. All right. Um, one more issue on here from me slash Steve asking if we wanted to do this before we cut the next release. So this is a proposal to eliminate the phrase virtual workspace because it is not accurate and confusing and replace it with some other term. The initial proposal is service. I realize that is a very generic and overloaded term, but it works. Uh, so I don't uh, know. Can I please it, ask you, put some qualifier in it. You know, call it the, the foo ser a foo service or something because the word service is so plain and has so many uses. Yeah. So. If y'all have other thoughts, um, feel free to suggest them. I think we should solidify a meaningful term before making any changes. Maybe let's give it a week for lazy consensus. Um, to Mike's point, I think we don't actually ever use the term virtual workspace alone. Uh, as noted in the first like five rows of this, we always prefix it with what it is actually doing, which speaks to <laughs> how uh, lacking of information those words really are. Yeah, but, collect um, collectively, these are all API surfaces. And like Steve said, they're always qualified. The only time we ever say just virtual workspace is to refer to them as a collective, but that's more from a coding standpoint or a topology standpoint and not anything that's user facing. Yeah, I think um, I, I would strongly suggest anyone that has thoughts here, anyone that's interacted with them, if you have a mental model um, that you use to explain this to yourself, like explain that, uh, share. I'd love to hear what people think. Uh, we should put a TTL on this. Maybe the next release is a good timeline. At a minimum, service doesn't mislead people the same way that Workspace does and <laughs> would be yeah. an improvement. Um, so I'll, I'll call time on, on that one for right now. Please uh, come into 2196 and add any comments if you have them. Um, given that we have a couple of minutes left, I did want to go look at 
Um, I'm not going to do issue triage today because I actually want to look at the milestone for 0 0.10. Um, given we we'd made a comment, I don't remember if this was in Slack or in a meeting about potentially changing the date so that instead of trying to do 0 0.10 by yesterday, which clearly didn't happen, and then 0 0.11 at the end of November, that and then another release like early mid December that we would remove one release from the train. And so between now and the end of 2022, we would either have one or two more releases. So we can do a 0 0.10 essentially when it's ready, hopefully in a week or two, and then a 0 0.11 towards the end of December, but before people go on holiday. Or we could just say, nah, we're only going to have one more release for 2022 whenever we feel it's ready. Like we can sort of rescope things and give folks more time. Um, so open to feedback, but definitely we're not cutting 0 0.10 today. <laughs> um, and uh, it's going to be at least a week or two out. So um, maybe take some time, look at the epics and look at what's in the milestone and what you might want to have before the end of the year and and maybe next week we can reconvene um hopefully folks will have had some time to think about it i'll send an email out to the dev mailing list um requesting comments and feedback and we can circle back um, next week if that sounds good to folks I see a couple plus ones in chat. So thanks, everybody. Um, I'll get that email out, and we will see you next time. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.